Um, as we've gotten into this series, we've been in, in Isaiah. We just started this last week. I felt God lead me here specifically for this time to start off the new year. And you remember we started off last week about talking about comfort my people. As I've been reading these verses about comfort and about God comforting Israel, I've actually been thinking a lot, probably some of you made this connection too, about my own children. I've been thinking about how in our kids' eyes, you know, in a lot of ways we're invincible to them. They see us as the smartest people in the world. They see us as the strongest people in the world, especially when you're the dad of two little girls that are four and six years old, you know? Uh, I, I'm not looking forward to the day when they really find out that I'm just a human being that doesn't know everything. Uh, um, I'm not looking forward to that. I, I like now where they look to me for all the answers and they want to ask me all the questions and think I'm the, the answer book. But the thing of it is, our kids look to us for comfort. You remember how this is. My kids believe that mommy and daddy kisses are the cure-all for every single boo-boo that they could ever have. Uh, it just immediately and instantly cures all things. And as I read in the scripture about a God who wants to bring comfort to his people, his people who have gone through unspeakable torment, loss, and pain in the book of Isaiah, I think about my children. I think about taking them in my arms, comforting them, and I think about how God longs to do that for you this morning. Now, if this is not where you are right now, and you're saying everything is great, then I apologize. But here's something I've learned about preaching from some people who are a lot wiser than me. If you preach to the brokenhearted, you'll never lack an audience. And so today what I'm preaching to is to those of you who for whatever reason in your life feel and sense this overwhelming need that you must have the comfort of the Lord to step in to your situation. Well, let me set up the background for you as we like to do before we get any further with the scripture this morning. Why was it that Israel needed this comfort? Why did Israel need this consolation? Well, it's because of the events that had just happened prior to the prophet's words. And it basically went something like this. It happened over the course of 10 years where the Babylonian armies came down and they started in 597 B.C. and laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. For those of you who like to keep the timeline running in your head about where we are in the Bible, this is where we are. They laid siege to Jerusalem. The armies come in. And you can imagine how Israel must have been feeling. You see, it wasn't that many generations ago that Isaiah had told them this was coming. He said to them in Isaiah chapter 1, let's just read it, verses 7 through 8. Your country lies desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. In your very presence, aliens devour your land. I thought that was cool when I was growing up seeing aliens in the Bible. Obviously, it just means strangers, foreigners, right? Aliens devour your land. It is desolate as overthrown by foreigners. And daughter Zion is left like a booth in a vineyard, like a shelter in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. That, that imagery there that the prophet is using. She, she's basically a, a, a booth in a cucumber field, being something that you take shelter in on a hot day. It was open. It, you had always had access to it. And it's as if the enemies are coming to Israel with total access and just taking whatever they want. But when Isaiah spoke these words, it hadn't happened yet. And so Israel is defiant. They will not humble themselves before their God. And they feel comfortable and safe in their situation. They actually are quite prideful about their riches. We saw this if you look last week in Isaiah 39. Close to the end of Hezekiah's reign, he shows this attitude. He shows how he's very much prideful about all the riches he has. And he thinks everything's okay. Actually, when Babylonian messengers come on a friendly mission, he gives them access and says, yeah, look. Look at all my riches. Look at my 
my treasuries. Look at my storehouses. Look at my wealth. And he wants them to know, ha, huh, Babylon, you guys think you got all these cool things. Look at what all we got. And so the people, just like their king, have this mentality that everything's okay. We're relatively secure. We're relatively healthy. So when the prophet says our cities are laid waste and desolate, God, please. So you can imagine then with me the fear that would have taken place, the trauma, as in fact, a couple generations later, the enemies are knocking on the gates. They are coming through the city. They are dispelling the myth that they had of this security in their head. And by the way, the armies aren't just marching into the cities. They're heading for where they've already seen the riches are. They're going right for their temple mount. And as they march up the hill to their temple mount, you imagine this invading enemy army in your home country. They're headed for your churches. They're going straight to the temple mount. And as they go in, they're finding all the vessels that are made of gold and they're breaking them apart, the scripture says. They're taking your altar of incense that's made out of gold and they're breaking it apart and they're carrying it off. The table of showbread, all of these sacred vessels that Israel had as a part of their worship, they're carting them off and you're traumatized. You know, this also leads to an interesting sidebar discussion that was the subject of one of the Indiana Jones films, actually. Where is that lost Ark of the Covenant? It's kind of where this comes from. The idea is that if all the vessels of the temple were taken off, where is that missing lost ark? Anyway, we're not going to get into that this morning. That could go down a rabbit hole real fast. But there's all kinds of legends about it, and it's really neat. Probably don't peruse the internet on this because you can get into some crazy stuff. But anyway, just trying to keep you on the straight and narrow this morning. But this is also the time in which Babylon would come in and they would take off some of the best and the brightest youths. You see, this was a part of their tactic. They come into the city. If they're conquering a new land, they don't just come in and slaughter everybody. No, they realize that it would be a lot smarter if they take some of the best looking, the brightest youth and actually assimilate them into their culture. So that's exactly what they do. And what book that is in our Old Testament do we see where young men are being taken off to the king's court in Babylon to serve under him? What book, Bible readers? Daniel. Daniel. Great. Wonderful. So Daniel, Hanani, Azariah, and Mishael, that's their Hebrew names, also known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they get carted off at this time into Babylon to serve at the behest of King Nebuchadnezzar. Friends, everything they had known prior to that point, was thrown into disarray. They were so traumatized by what they had seen that now God sends word to the prophet and wants to bring words of comfort for them. The time of taking them to task over their sin and pronouncing judgment was over. God is now sending out His love letters to His people. They need to know that they still have a God who cares, that they still have a God who loves them. And maybe, perhaps, that's right where you are today. Perhaps you need these love letters from the Lord reminding you once again of His faithfulness. Because these are as much for us as they were for them. Why do I say that so confidently? Because all of these passages prefigure what the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would do for his people. So hear these words of comfort in this second Sunday of 2018. God says in Isaiah 42 verse 1, Here is my servant whom I uphold. Now I'm going to explain to you in a moment why this is the case, but for right now I want to help your understanding. When you see in these passages the word servant, you can assume that God is talking about the coming Messiah. So you see servant, you understand God means his Messiah who is coming. 
Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. A dimly burning wick he will not quench. I want you to keep that imagery in your mind. A bruised reed he won't break. A wick that's almost burned all the way down that's about to go out. He won't put it out. Keep that in your mind. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his teaching. Now there are several people throughout the scripture who are referred to as servant. So what makes this one so special? Isaiah called the servant of the Lord. Eliakim called the servant of the Lord. It, this is all in the book of Isaiah. Even Israel as a whole nation referred to as the servant of the Lord. So what makes this servant so special? Why are we so confident that this servant is prefiguring the Messiah, Jesus Christ? Why do we believe that? Well, there's several reasons. Notice what he's going to do. He's going to bring forth justice to the whole earth. To every single nation on earth. That's number one. It also says that he will never grow faint. <laughs> now, if you're talking about Isaiah, he grew faint. If you're talking about Israel, we know Israel grew faint. And they struggled with faithfulness all the time. No, this servant would serve God in perfection. Not only would he bring perfect justice, he would be morally perfect. He would never grow faint. He would never falter. Friends, that, and Israel had to know at the time, this is speaking about someone they had yet to experience. This is speaking about someone that they had yet to know. He's going to bring hope to the whole earth. I mean, the whole earth. Did you notice what it says about him? When it says he's going to bring justice to the nations. Can, can, I, can I step up on a soapbox this morning for a second? Can I make a little sidebar for you this morning? That God, according to what I read about His Messiah in Isaiah 42, God is for every nation. God is not exclusively America's God. God is the God of all people. And He has people all over this world. And some of the finest people I've ever met some of my dearest friends, fellow pastors in this district, are from Haiti. And some of the greatest Christians I've ever had the privilege of knowing are from Africa. That's right. Did you know that when North America and Christianity is declining because theological liberalism has put us into a place where we no longer believe the Bible and we no longer believe that the Holy Spirit is active in the church, that Christianity in America is declining? Would you like to know where it's exploding? In what we call the global south or the two-thirds world in Africa, Southeast Asia, South America? Did you know that they have already begun their mission to the West? Did you know that there's going to be more South Korean missionaries on the field by the mid-2020s than there are North American missionaries on the field? So sure, it offends me when people say vulgar things about my brothers and sisters in Christ in other countries. Sure it does. Friends, God is the God of every single nation. He loves them more infinitely than you can ever imagine. And one of the things that we have to understand right off the bat is when God says, comfort my people, what He's going to do for us in this passage is He is going to give us an understanding that broadens so far beyond just our little four and no more mentality. We're going to see a God revealed in Isaiah 42 that is seeking to redeem every single corner of His creation. 
And in seeking to redeem them, he is sending his servant. Listen carefully. You'll see it in this passage. Not just for Israel, but for every nation under heaven. For the whole world. In fact, if God's people have any place in this prophecy, it's not in the position of the strong one who's going to bring out deliverance. Quite frankly, if we have any place in this prophecy, it's in verse number three. We're the bruised reed. We're the candle wick that's about to be extinguished. We're the ones who are just dimly glowing. But I told you I wanted you to keep that picture in your mind. You can do a lot with reeds. You can build stuff with them. You can make paper out of them. There's a lot you can do with reeds. But here is something that you couldn't do. You couldn't take a bruised reed and make it straight again. Not in the natural you couldn't. Once it was damaged, it wouldn't have much hope for you. A little wick that's about to be extinguished doesn't provide you much light at night. So it's pretty useless. So what we could possibly do is just discard it, right? Because it's useless. But this is what God is saying that His servant, the Messiah, will do. He won't break that bruised reed. He won't put out that little dimly lit wick. Why? Because as Brennan Manning says about this passage... Jesus is relentlessly tender with us. Amen. He is tender. He is gentle. He takes fragile things in His hand and He knows how to heal them. Friend, a word for somebody in here today is, is that God, before He called you, He knew how fragile you were. Amen. Come on, somebody. Before he ever said your name and before you ever even knew you were in this world, he saw the pain, he saw the brokenness, he saw the things that your family would do that would affect you, that had no whatsoever bearing on your own decision. He saw it all and he knew he was dealing with a fragile, broken person. But the scripture says he doesn't break those kinds. He takes them in his arms. Like a shepherd gathers sheep. And he loves them. Friend, Jesus loves you beyond your worthiness. He loves you beyond having it all together. He loves you in your brokenness. Now, why are you trying to make it like you have it all together? Don't do that before God. That's useless. Own it and realize that He wants to love you through it. And He wants to heal you. The people of Babylon would have loved it if the candle went out in Israel. They would have loved it if all the hope that got all the way down to a little glow would have just gone out. But Israel kept holding on to hope because of these words of comfort. Israel kept holding on to hope because they had a tender Savior who was, who was gently pursuing them. God calls out to you today and says, rest in me. I believe there have been hardly any greater words penned in the verses of a hymn than the ones that Will Thompson penned when he said softly and tenderly Jesus is calling calling for you and for me see on the portals he's waiting and watching watching for you and for me come home you who are weary come home and then he says earnestly I love that because while Jesus is unrelenting and will not stop pursuing, he's earnestly pursuing and yet all the while, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. That's the picture of the God. That's the picture of the Messiah that we read about in chapter 42. Now looking at verses 5 through 7. In verses 1 through 4, God spoke to the people about His servant, His Messiah that was coming. In verses 5 through 7, I want you to notice that He switches and He begins to speak directly to the servant. He starts to speak to the Messiah. Thus says the Lord, thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath 
to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. Friends, as Christians, and we read this passage, we have no doubt in our minds that this is speaking about Jesus. This is speaking about the one who was to come, who would bring light to the nations. But I want to call your attention specifically to what God says to his Messiah. In verse number five, he speaks and refers to himself as the one who created the heavens and stretched them out. Notice a lot of times in these passages where the prophets would be speaking. And if they wanted you as the people of God to expand your vision out beyond just your little conclave, beyond just your little group, they would establish the theme that God is creator. If you establish that God is creator, then that means every single human being. Believing what the Bible says about them, God sees some of his image in them. And so when, when the prophet is speaking to Israel and he goes, hey, hey, God says he's the creator. He's the one who stretched out everything. And he's the one who's given breath to every creature. They're saying, look, God doesn't just belong to us according to scripture. He is everyone's God. He wants all people to belong to him. And I love what Barry Webb points out, Old Testament scholar commenting on Isaiah. He says, implicit in creation is a covenant that God makes with the whole human race. Notice he doesn't say with the church. Now the church has the covenant, the new covenant of Christ's blood. So don't misunderstand me. But God has also covenanted himself. He has obligated, he has given himself to the whole human race. And so don't ever make any mistake about it. His heart and his passion and his goal will be that every person you know comes into a life-changing, transformed relationship with Jesus. Without exception. You think of that this morning. Everyone you know, God is longing to call their heart to Him. Now, how are you working in this world as His vessel and carrying out His mission? The backdrop here is, of course, all the Gentile nations outside of Israel. This would have been probably hard for them to experience. Because when God speaks about every nation as an Israelite living at this time, you had to accept that he was also talking about Babylon. <laughs> that he was also talking about the nation who had just carted you off and held you in captivity. And Israel probably looked around and they probably pitied themselves. Why can I imagine that so well? Well, because we pity ourselves all the time, don't we? We're sort of like the psalmist that looks around and it seems that the wicked are always prospering, right? It seems that the people who aren't serving God are the ones getting ahead. And why is it here I am trying to be faithful, trying to give to the Lord, giving of my finances, giving of my time. But it seems I'm always coming up short and here they are always coming out ahead. What's, what's going on here? And I'm sure Israel sitting in their position looking at this people that had them in captivity, I'm sure the thought was, well, we're forsaken. So why does God need to worry with them? We're the ones sitting in a dungeon. Why does God say he wants to bring prisoners out from every nation? We're the ones that are hurting. We're the Friends, listen, you can be in a dungeon and you can be perfectly free. Did you get that? You can be sitting in darkness and have all the light in the world. Oh yeah, you can. Because if your spirit's free, there is nothing that people can do to that reality, even when they try to bind you in the outward reality. Friends, your spiritual deliverance is so much more important than your physical deliverance. Israel had it switched. They didn't understand. In fact, the people that you see all that stuff that they're accumulating for themselves that makes you get that green eye, all that stuff is going to burn someday. They're not going to take not one ounce of it with them. 
You understand this? And so those people that have put all their hope in things, people that have put all their hope in material, those people are to be pitied. They're the ones God is talking about in these nations that are sitting in dark dungeons. They're the ones that need a light to spring up around them. I don't care what physical place you're in. I'm telling you that you today need to live into the freedom that has been gloriously gifted to the sons and daughters of God. You need to start walking like you're free. You need to start believing what's already true. Like you are the freest person walking around because you, my friend, have been called forth by Jesus. And there's nothing to bring you back into bondage. And then God goes on to say, and I have to say this, I cannot fathom words that are any more beautiful to hear from God's heart to you than these. Where God says in verse 9, see, see, the former things have come to pass and new things I now declare. Can, can you just even imagine for a second anything more beautiful than hearing that from God's heart directly to yours? You fill in the blanks. Whatever he means by former things. Whatever he means by that. You fill, the, you fill in the blanks. See now, the former things have come to pass and I'm about to do a new thing. Friends, God sent me here to tell somebody that He is always, every day, every morning, the God of new beginnings. Amen. He is the God who is always making things new. No matter how bleak, no matter how dark yesterday was, God says, today I'm doing a new thing. Today I want to do a fresh thing in you. I want to do a new work among you. I was reading a book this week by Henry Nouwen. It's called In the Name of Jesus, and it's his reflections on leadership as he served the church for so many years. And, and after he served for 25, 30 years, he says, you know, you, you'd think, you'd assume that after I've been doing this a while, that things would begin to come easy, that my relationship with the Lord, that I could just sort of sit back and, and things would just always come easy. Faith would be easy. I could just talk to him in relationship like it's no problem. He says, but no. He says, the temptation to grow colder and colder tries to set in. And he says, so I came to this point where I experienced that, that God, even after 30 years of serving in ministry, studying theology, this guy taught theology at Harvard and Yale and Notre Dame. And after all these years, he says, I studied all these things. He says, I still needed God to bring me fresh new insight. I still needed God to reveal new things about his heart to me. Maybe that's where you are today. You see, I've been walking with him for, for 50 years. Friends, here's the deal. God's always doing a new thing with you. He's always got something to teach you. He's always got a part of his nature that you haven't quite grasped yet. And he wants you to learn more about that. God's showing up. And God's saying, the former things have passed. That relationship with me that you had that was so vibrant a few days ago, it's got to be new today. It's got to be fresh today. I've got things to teach you. He says this may have been a really hard season that you just went through. It sure was for Israel. Tough season that they've gone through. He says, you may have been beat up. You may have been exploited. People may have used and abused you to get what they needed and then moved on. And whoever that person is for you, I don't know. Whatever that situation is for you. But God shows up. And He says, the former things are done. They're over. You need to receive that in your spirit this morning. 
I can be confident to tell you that God's telling you that this morning because from His Word, He says, See, I am making, that is, always in the process of making all things new. You are not defined by who you were yesterday. No, you're not. You're not defined by yesterday's failure. You are not defined by what someone else said about you yesterday. God says the former things have passed away. Now, why don't you believe it? Why don't you believe it? So many of our problems in life come from holding on to old patterns. Holding on to relationships that you should have let go of years ago. And simply the status quo when God is wanting to do something new. Friends, every time God leads you into something new, it's good news. But it comes sometimes as a disruption. It's perceived sometimes as a curse. But every time God's leading you into something new, He has a blessing waiting for you on the other side. And I'm not trying to prime and pump you up and say God's got the new car sitting in the parking lot right now. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to tell you that God has something greater than material wealth. He's got something waiting for you, friends, in this new season. But where we get stuck is we get hung up on wanting what's comfortable. We'll deal with failure. We'll deal with mediocrity. We'll deal with another year of not doing what God has enabled us to do. Not living up to our potential, both in the spirit and in the natural. Not doing anything other than what we did last year. We'll deal with that. We'll stay there because it doesn't cost as much. Because it's a comfortable place to be in. But let me just tell you, friends, we have no right to complain about our situation when God shows us a new thing and we go, ah, I'll keep my status quo instead. Because that new thing over there, you're not exactly showing me all of it just yet. And he seldom does. He's actually asked you, he's, he's got the flashlight of the word and he's just kind of shining it. And he goes, now I want you to walk here. Now I want you to take another step. And you're going, but, but I don't know what's beyond this step. Friends, there's no better place to be than walking in that little light that He's shining. When you see the, the full picture, when you're looking back on the other side, you're going to understand just, just exactly what He took you through. But I came to tell somebody today, you've got to be open to God's new things. You've got to be open to God's new situations. Your spirit has to remain open to Him because ultimately, this is what God's in the business of doing. He's going to do this for the whole earth. He says in Isaiah 65, 17, these words, For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Isn't that wonderful? That ultimately, as God is making you new right now, his goal, He's been redeeming this creation ever since it fell. And His goal is to provide for its ultimate, ultimate recreation. The ultimate newness. New heavens and a new earth. And the promise to you, if you'll keep marching towards that destiny, listen, the promise to you is you won't even remember the bad things of yesterday. That they will be so insignificant, that they will be so small in light of God and His glory and this place that He has brought you to. No less than the new creation, that it will be so glorious that those things will fade as a distant memory. i got some things I wouldn't mind forgetting. I'm just going to be honest with you. I'd be fine to forget some things. God wants to strike me with amnesia when I walk into the new kingdom. I say, praise the Lord. But friends, it probably comes as no surprise to you after all these wonderful, precious promises that happen, Isaiah begins to break out into song. He says, after all these new things have been talked about, he says, sing to the Lord a new song. His praise from the end of the earth. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the coastlands and their inhabitants. Let the desert and its town lift up their voice. 
And what you got to know about this is when he talks about Kedar and Selah, these are little towns that are in the outer rims, the outer regions. So he's basically going, hey, Kedar and Selah, can you guys hear me? You guys lift up your voice and sing too. Because the desert and its towns are going to lift up their voice. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastlands. Thanks be to God. Barry Webb points out that Isaiah is a lot like the Apostle Paul here. He gets so excited about the word he's getting from the Lord. Paul does this a lot when he's writing about the gospel. He, In the middle of it, he just breaks out into a doxology. He just has to sing and he just has to write a song in. Giving praise to the Lord. Isaiah does this. He's so overwhelmed by this truth that's been downloaded into him. He begins to sing to the Lord a new song for the new things he's doing. And as he begins to, to sing that new song, he comes to the point that I want to bring us to today. That the, the, the thought I want to leave us with is that every blessing in the Word is yours. Every promise is yours, but I want you to hear me. It came at a cost. That the servant that he was speaking of would not just be the servant who would come like a mighty king and it wouldn't cost him anything to bring about these blessings in Christ. No, Isaiah describes him in verse 13. says, The Lord goes forth like a soldier. Like a warrior, he stirs up his fury. He cries out. He shouts aloud. He shows himself mighty against his foes. The imagery here is that the Lord's going to fight for this victory. He's going to win it for us. But don't ever make the mistake of thinking that it came automatic. It came as God came in the person of Jesus Christ, which is what this passage is foretelling. As God came in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, He stared down death, He stared down hell, Satan, and all of His armies in the face, and He defeated them. And in their defeat, He raises again and He triumphs over them. But don't you forget that God said He would come and He would take on the pain of doing it. Because look at the next verse. For a long time I have held my peace. I have kept still and restrained myself. Now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp and pant. This is the Lord. Now what is God saying? I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp. I will pant. God is saying if it means my suffering for you, I will do it. Now, you Bible readers will probably know that this, this would have come as a strange words to Israel. Their God was all-powerful. They knew that. He could do anything He wanted, but their God didn't suffer. No, no, no. This is something they could not conceive of. What do you mean, God, you're going to cry out in pain for our deliverance? What do you mean, God, that you're going to birth our deliverance? What? How, do, how does that work? They couldn't conceive of what you and I know to be true today. Which is that God would come as a man. He would come and He wouldn't just deliver us out of suffering. He would go through suffering with us couldn't conceive of it but he would and it would cost him and he would experience pain and he would know what loss was like and he would feel your hurts he would know exactly what he was delivering you from friends like a mighty warrior Christ comes today, and it's Him I want you to see.